to some of our folks and they have the chance to share those songs with us. I am. Matt, thank you so much for sharing that song. And I love just the honesty of it. And I do believe that that's something that many can relate with. And I love it right before this sermon because I think it sets up our scripture this morning really well. We are in the midst of a sermon series on the Bible book of Ruth. And if you haven't uh, turned there in your Bibles yet, I encourage you to do so. Um, even though my Bible doesn't want to stay on that page because the air conditioning is going, but I'm very happy for the air conditioning to be going. So, <laughs> The book of Ruth is named Ruth, but really, honestly, if you read the whole thing through, you see that it's a lot a story of Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi. And the way that it starts is with incredible heartache and loss. We've already heard a little bit about it from our children's message this morning from Barb. Naomi, her husband, and her two sons lived in the area of Bethlehem during the time of the judges. But because of a famine in their region, they decided to move out of the promised land into the land of Moab, where they thought things would be better. And when they got there, at some point, their boys married Moabite women. And then the absolute worst happened. First, Naomi's husband dies, the patriarch of the family. And then, before they were able to become fathers themselves, Naomi's two sons both died, leaving Naomi in desperate need in a foreign land with two foreign daughter-in-laws. It was an incredibly dark time for her, and we, we saw that when Ruth and Naomi, Ruth, the one daughter-in-law who stuck with Naomi, they came back into Bethlehem. Remember that Naomi, when people recognized her, said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. It means bitter. And that's what sets up the overarching question that I think runs throughout this book of Ruth. The overarching question is this. What is God doing in the darkest of times? And it's an incredibly important question because every single one of us here today we'll have a Ruth chapter 1 season in our lives. It won't be the exact same circumstances, but it will be hard. It will be dark. It will be extremely difficult. It will be painful. Many of you I know have already been through a season like that. And, and some of you are in that kind of a season right now, and I'm so glad that you're here in the midst of it. And that's why this ancient story out of the Bible is so relevant for us today. Naomi and Ruth were in a season when they were saying, any time now, God, any time. You could make yourself known, you, you could provide, you could take care of us, you could get us out of this mess that we're in. And in Ruth chapter two, that's exactly what God did. In God's providence, Ruth ends up in the field of a guy named Boaz during harvest. And Boaz provides for her and protects her. And when Ruth comes back and reports to Naomi about Boaz's generosity and Boaz's kindness, we see this dark cloud begin to lift off of Naomi's shoulders. Boaz provided food and protection for Naomi during the harvest. But in chapter 3, the harvest is over. Winter is coming. And the future for Naomi and Ruth is still uncertain. Once again, they're in this extraordinarily vulnerable position. There is no rest, no security for these two childless widows. Once again, they're in this desperate situation. And desperate times call for desperate measures. And that's exactly what Naomi and Ruth lean into at the beginning of chapter 3. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3, and let's look at these first five verses together. Hear now God's holy and awesome word. Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. One day Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I should not try, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. 
Wash and perfume, perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your awesome word, now by your Holy Spirit present here among us. Bring this word to life, that this ancient story would not be ancient to us today as if it didn't matter anymore, but that we would know the good news that comes through your word and that we would be changed by it today. We ask in Jesus' name, and everyone who agreed said, Amen. Amen. You know, one of the things I love about this book of Ruth is kindness. Megan talked about it last week. Kindness that is shown in multiple directions. Clearly, as Barb was mentioning to the kids, there is a relationship of kindness between Naomi and Ruth. Ruth is the one who famously says to Naomi in chapter 1, when Naomi's encouraging her to go back home, Ruth says, where you go, Naomi, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. She makes this incredible covenant with her. That's kindness from Ruth to Naomi, from daughter-in-law to mother-in-law. Imagine that. But here in chapter 3, now Naomi shows her heart of kindness towards Ruth. And you can hear it in that verse 1 when she says, My daughter, not my daughter-in-law, my daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be provided for? And if you're looking at the NIV text, you'll notice that there's a little footnote to that verse because literally the Hebrew says, Should I not try to find rest for you. Some translations keep it as rest. Other translations make it security. Should I not try to find security for you? And others like the NIV make it home. None of those are bad translations because they get to what Naomi is wanting for Ruth. But I think using the word rest helps us think more broadly about their situation. And I think it also connects with our situation. Naomi and Ruth had no rest. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they couldn't sleep. It it means that they were insecure. And, And whenever we are operating in a place of insecurity, we are never truly at rest, right? How do we experience that kind of insecurity in our lives? Well, we can experience it physically. So, for example, if you don't have a home, it's hard to find rest because you're a person constantly having to move from one place to the next. Imagine how disruptive it would be for your life if you suddenly found yourself with no home and no money. Would that be insecure? Yes. Insecurity can manifest itself physically, but it also can manifest itself relationally. And when we are relationally insecure, we cannot rest because we're constantly trying to make up for that insecurity. Let me give you a very personal example. At some point over the last uh, six and a half years as a senior pastor, I have finally figured something out. I finally figured out why so many senior pastors are weird. (laughs) Have you noticed that? A lot of senior pastors are a little weird relationally, right? And and here's, here's why. It's because one of our constant struggles is insecurity. In fact, a lot of senior leaders in all kinds of organizations struggle with insecurity. Why? Because everyone is watching them. Everyone has an opinion about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Everyone is analyzing their every move. And and please hear me. I'm not saying this is your problem. I'm saying this is my problem. It's one of the reasons that it's so important for me to believe the truth of the gospel for me. But whenever I am operating out of a place of insecurity relationally, I am not resting because I'm always trying to prove myself. I'm always trying to get you to like me. 
I'm always trying to get you to accept me. I'm always trying to put my peace in the way you feel about me. So I'm never at rest. That's what it's like to operate out of insecurity. There is no rest in the midst of insecurity. Insecurity that's physical, relational, spiritual, or emotional. And Naomi recognizes that. She is experiencing it herself, and she wants something different for Ruth. And so she comes up with this incredible, risky plan in the midst of her desperation. She says to Ruth, Is not Boaz with whose servant girls you've been, you have been a kinsman of ours? It's, in other words, isn't Boaz one of our husband's relatives who might have the ability to help us? You see, it's a rhetorical question. And the answer is obviously yes. Because according to the Mosaic law, any male relative could be what they called a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer who had the privilege or the responsibility to act for a relative who was in need. In lots of different ways. And so Naomi continues, Tonight Boaz will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. See, first of all, that's a sign that the harvest is over. And, and now processing the harvest has begun. But it also means that, that Boaz will not be tonight in his home. Because Boaz will be like any other owner of a large harvest. He's going to be at the Boaz camp out, kind of like the FPC camping trip. And he's going to be on the threshing floor, spending the night with his men, guarding their harvest. In other words, there's going to be tonight, or in this couple of days, unusual access to Boaz that Naomi and Ruth would not normally have. And it's going to be actually in more of a public setting than he normally would be in the privacy of his own bedroom. And so Naomi shares her suggested plan with Ruth. And this is where the book of Ruth gets at least PG-13. And depending on what commentary you read, some commentaries go all the way to rated R. I'm going to stick with PG-13. Look again at verses 3 and 4. Naomi says to Ruth, wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes and then go down to the threshing floor. But but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, note the place where he's lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. So Naomi's overarching plan is to get Boaz to take Ruth as his wife. And, and so she wants Ruth to essentially make an incredibly bold marriage proposal. She's to get herself all fancied up like she's going to the prom or something and then wait until all the work is done so that she doesn't interrupt the men and make a spectacle of herself in front of all the men. Let them eat and drink as they would on every night and then the guys go to bed and to pay attention to where Boaz lies down because you don't want to end up at the wrong guy's feet. That's certainly true. <laughs> and then to put herself at his feet. To put herself in a place of submission. To put herself in a place of surrender. And then uncover his feet and wait to see what he says. Now, if you're like me, you're saying, what is the deal with the feet? <laughs> Maybe cold feet will wake him up. <laughs> but actually, there's a picture there, and the author leaves it intentionally vague, but it's a sexual picture. It's basically Ruth communicating that she is available to Boaz sexually. And so Naomi's idea is to get Boaz to take Ruth as his wife. But this is an incredibly risky plan. It's not a seduction. 
Don't read it the wrong way. Naomi is not asking Ruth to take matters into her own hands or to trick Boaz or to take advantage of him when he's vulnerable. That's not what's happening. But clearly, she is asking Ruth to put herself completely at the mercy of Boaz. Just think about all that could go wrong with this plan. I mean, Boaz could totally take advantage of her. First of all, she's going to a place where a whole bunch of men have been working all day, and then they've eaten and drank, and now they're going to bed. And she's walking into that environment looking as best as she possibly could. Boaz could totally take advantage of her. Boaz could do tremendous harm to her or, or allow the other men to do so. But also Boaz could just totally reject her. He could be uh, just turned completely off by this thing that she does. She could be totally rejected. He could take great offense at her boldness and kick her to the curb. Or there's a slight chance that it might work. And it might be the way that Ruth and Naomi finally find some rest and some security. It is a risky plan. Naomi knows it, Ruth knows it, and we as the readers are intended to know it as well. I will do whatever you say. Don't you love that? I will do whatever you say. It's what every parent wishes their child would say to them. <laughs> right? But this is so much more than that, church. This is Ruth putting her life on the line. And why? That's what Barb asked the kids. Why? Well, to be completely honest, we don't exactly know why, but it's clear that she cares deeply about Naomi. Ruth knows that if Naomi's plan works, it will not only benefit Ruth. Who else will it benefit? It will also greatly benefit Naomi. If Boaz takes Ruth as his wife, Naomi also will find rest. She also will have security. Ruth's love for Naomi makes her willing to risk her own life for Naomi's security. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. That's exactly what Ruth is willing to do in this situation. But I also believe she's willing to do it based on what she has experienced so far in Boaz. As we'll learn in just a few verses later in the chapter, Boaz was not the only relative in town. He's not the only option, but Boaz is the one in God's providence where Ruth happened to be gleaning. And Boaz is the one who showed her kindness. And Boaz is the one who brought her to his table and gave her more than enough to eat. And Boaz is the one who sent her home with a bunch of barley. And so Boaz is the one to whom Ruth is willing to make herself completely vulnerable. Boaz is the one at whose feet Ruth is willing to put herself. And, and what happens next, church, is, is wonderful and remarkable and so important for a culture like ours to hear. But we're going to actually wait until next week to talk about that. For now, I want us to simply focus on these five verses. What is it that you think God wants you to hear? in these verses about who God is, about what he has done for you, about who you are and about how you are to live. Naomi and Ruth needed rest. They, they needed security. So the question for you is, where do you go to find true rest and security? The Bible teaches us and, and my life experience confirms this, that there is only one place for us to go to find true rest. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
See, I don't know about you, but I see tremendous symbolism in this scene as it unfolds between Ruth and Boaz. I see Ruth as a symbol of God's people and Boaz as a symbol of God the Redeemer. And with that symbolism in mind, when Ruth lies down at the feet of Boaz, putting herself completely in his mercy, a sign of her absolute dependence upon him to do whatever he tells her to do, what a perfect picture it is of what life in Christ is meant to be putting ourselves at the feet of our Lord to do whatever he tells us to do. Beloved, have you ever simply put your whole life at the mercy of Jesus, the way that Ruth put her life at the mercy of Boaz? I mean, it's a risky move. In in one sense, to put ourselves at the feet of Jesus, it's costly. It means that we have to let go of the things that we hold dear. It means we have to confront our hurts and our habits and our hang-ups. It means we have to repent of our idolatry and all the other things in which we try to find our security or our identity or our value. It means we have to give up control. And that feels risky, right? But on the other hand, Remember that the success of Naomi's plan for Ruth depended completely on the righteous character of Boaz. For Naomi's plan to work best, Boaz needed to act righteously and kindly. She had seen him act that way already, but it was still a risk because he's a man who might fall prey to temptation or to evil. But beloved, hear this good news. The one who invites us to find our rest in him is Jesus Christ, the crucified and resurrected Son of God. And he is perfectly righteous and absolutely faithful. He is the one who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing for the very nature of as the very, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, Paul says. Therefore, God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So yes, it is costly to put ourselves at his feet, but hear this, there is no ultimate risk when we put ourselves in surrender at the feet of Jesus. There is only abundant reward. God's lavish grace, God's perfect providence, God's good and redeeming will, God's covenant faithfulness, ultimate security, absolute rest administered to us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's what awaits us when we surrender ourselves at the feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. That is good news. Have you ever surrendered yourself to Jesus Christ, the crucified, resurrected, and exalted Son of God? In the midst of the darkest of times, This book reminds us that God is always at work. He's working to bring his redeeming transformation. And this story reminds us that the best way for us to experience and participate in his epic story of redemption is to put ourselves at the feet of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to do whatever he tells us to do. There is no better position. There is no better place. That is our only hope, church, for true rest, for absolute security. So may it be so for you. Whatever it is that's going on in your life today, may it be so for you today and every day that you submit yourself at the feet of Jesus and do what he tells you to do. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, 
Thank you for your incredible grace and mercy and kindness to us. That even though we have nothing in our lives that would deserve this, that you and your love have made a place for us to find true rest so that we don't have to live in insecurity anymore. And even in seasons when there are tangible insecurities in our lives, we can rest secure in Christ and in your love for us and have peace in the midst of the storm, have faith in the midst of the darkness, have hope in the midst of whatever comes our way. So God, today, would you fill us up with your spirit and draw us to that place that we would be, that our answer to that invitation would be like Ruth's answer to Naomi, I will do whatever you ask. And that even if there's a person here who's never fully surrendered their life to Jesus, that today would be the day that they become convinced by your spirit that there's no better place to be than at the feet of Jesus, completely vulnerable, completely surrendered, completely out of control, trusting you, Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, for the forgiveness of sins, for life everlasting, for the indwelling of the Spirit, for your call in our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, and work in us to surrender to you today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. 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 I want to invite, uh, as we finish here, the Albania service and learning trip.